Good evening. I'm Jacob Weiss, director of Yeshiva University Museum. And together with Billy Weitzer, executive director and our partner um, at Leo Beck Institute, we're delighted to welcome you to the opening of our new exhibition, Kinder Transport, Rescuing Children on the Brink of War. One week from yesterday will mark the 80th anniversary of the very first Kinder Transport from Nazi-occupied Europe to freedom in the United Kingdom and eventually parts elsewhere. When this remarkable rescue effort was completed only nine months later, close to 10,000 children had been rescued. We are delighted and honored to have a number of kinder here with us this evening. And so we'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating their presence with us. Could I ask all of the kinder in this room to stand? And of course, we know that these 10,000 young lives helped produce exponentially more thousands of young lives. And so can I ask all the children and descendants of Kinder to stand and be acknowledged? Thank you. In agreeing to open its borders to thousands of Jewish children, something most countries did not do, the United Kingdom did not require visas, but it did put in place strict conditions upon their admittance. Refugee organizations had to fund the costs of the rescue operations and ensure that none of the children would become a financial burden on British society. All the children had to have sponsors. Similarly, in order to develop to put together and present this ambitious exhibition and its related programming, the first major museum exhibition in America to focus on the kinder transport, we needed and benefited from the generous support of several key foundations and individuals. I'd like to thank them for making this possible, and in particular, the Azraeli Foundation, the David Berg Foundation, we're delighted to have Abby Kaftal here with us this evening, the Corette Foundation, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Corette Foundation board member, Judge Abraham Sofer, and members of his family, including his wife and LBI board member, Marion Scheuer Sofer, the Gruce Hirsch Family Foundation, and a very generous sponsor by the name of Anonymous. Thank you. I'd like to, I'd like to highlight a couple of aspects of this project that give that give it particular meaning both as an exhibition and as an exhibition that was developed here at the Center for Jewish History. This exhibition was conceived as a collaboration between Yeshiva University Museum and the Leo Beck Institute, two of the five partners that together form the Center for Jewish History. Through exhibitions and collections, public and educational programs, we bring to life at Yeshiva University Museum the history and culture of Jews from across history and the generations. And so we were delighted to partner with the Leo Beck Institute, which explores the culture of German Jew Jewish speaking Jewry and whose remarkable collections, and in particular the letters between parents and kinder, we were able to highlight in this exhibition. And this was really a choice and beautiful partnership. You'll see related exhibitions upstairs here at the center. LBI's 1938 project, which, uh, about which uh, Billy will speak uh, shortly, and Yeshiva University Museum's Lost and Found uh, exhibition, Lost and Found, a family photo album, which has in itself a related subject. This is the story of a family photo album that was smuggled out of the Kovno ghetto in the years uh, as the war was beginning, saved uh, by a non-Jewish woman, uh, and then years later, uh, rediscovered and reunited with the descendants of the family. So together, these exhibitions really bring to life aspects of the material visual culture of pre-war Jewish life. I'd like to thank especially Billy Weitzer for his partnership and for embracing the idea of this exhibition. 
and to his colleagues at LBI, and in particular, Frank Mecklenburg, Magda Vrobel, Renata Evers, Michael Simonson, Stephen Goldberg, David Brown, and Carrie Jedikla. I'd like to thank my colleagues at Yeshiva University Museum, Bonnie Dara Michaels and Alana Benson, and in particular, Alona Moradoff for sensitively, insightfully, and heroically curating the exhibition. In addition to the loans we received from museums and collections, here in America and abroad, we benefited from the generosity and enthusiasm of Kinder in sharing their objects with us. And, and we've been um, speaking to them uh, in the exhibition space. And I'd like to thank them for participating in this project with us, for sharing not just their objects, but their stories with us, which really made this exhibition come to life and made it possible. And I'd like to acknowledge, in particular, Melissa Hacker, president of the Kinder Transport Association, KTA. Um, Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, the KTA, uh, if you don't know about it, is a non-for-profit organization that unites these child refugees um, and their descendants for connecting, uh, and we thank Melissa for connecting us both to objects and to people. Um, and if you'd like more information about the KTA, Melissa will be happy to speak with you in the reception afterwards. These objects would be but that, an assortment of objects if not for the beautiful and thoughtful design of Jonathan Alger and his team at CNG Partners, who helped make the emotional power of these stories resonate and come to life in the gallery. Finally, I'd like to reflect on one aspect of the exhibition that, to me, highlights the remarkable nature of the Kinder Transport as an exhibition. The decision to send one's child to a foreign country from one's homeland on the kinder transport is perhaps too monumental and removed historically from us for any of us to grasp. But many of these objects highlight just that, the life-saving spirit and conscientiousness that went into this most remarkable and unfathomable of occurrences and decisions. The three objects, just three among the many objects that we present in the exhibition, um, reflect on this, I think, in a particular way. Um, on the left is um, a beautiful teddy bear taken on a kinder transport by 14-year-old Jack Helleman in 1939. Um, in the middle, an olive wood spice tower with clothes for the use during Havdalah, the ceremony to close Shabbat sent with 16-year-old Hannah Kronheim when she left on a kinder transport from Cologne on February 2nd, 1939. And on the right, a dress taken on the kinder transport by Greta Hirsch on January 7th, 1939. Otto Hirsch, a leader of the Jewish community in Germany, arranged for his daughters Greta and Ursula to escape on the kinder transport. And their mother, Martha Hirsch, worked on this dress, sewing, uh, sewing it for days and nights before the girl's departure crying the entire time. Greta was a serious violin student, and it is possible or probably likely that her mother wanted her to have this dress in case she had an opportunity to perform while in England or abroad. Um, the objects on the left, courtesy of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and the dress, courtesy of the Greta Hirsch uh, family. Together, these objects, chosen with a mind to strengthening from left to right, the children's emotional, religious and professional lives in their parents' absence, both set into high relief the very unbanal evil, the very horrendous evil that these parents faced. And it also highlights the life and individual affirming nature of what these parents in their supportive, conscientious, and life-affirming decisions did in the face of that evil. And so um, we are delighted to bring these objects together both to highlight these and other themes, and uh, delighted to join you in celebrating it this evening. Um, I'd like to, and I'm honored um, to invite um, two kinder um, who are here with us to ref offer reflections on um, their experiences and on the experience of the kinder transport in general. Um, and first, um, I'd love to invite Lucy Lang, um, uh, some of whose um, objects and stories are in the exhibition. Um, Lucy, um, a uh, trustee and a longtime friend of the museum, who will offer some reflections on the Kinder Transport.
I'd like to thank the Yeshiva University Museum and the Leo Beck Institute for this wonderful exhibit. And I appreciate all of you people who came in this terrible weather to celebrate with us our 80th anniversary. I was a kind with my sister, Erica Jesselson. We left Vienna in 1938. I was one of the bigger children because I was 15 years old. But I must say, I didn't quite realize at that time what a sacrifice my parents made by sending us away not knowing whether they would ever see us again. I cannot visualize doing a thing like that. Unfortunately, most of these kids, which were from age five on, never saw their parents again. My sister, Eric, and I were lucky that my father happened to be born in Paris, and the French quarter was empty. So when affidavits came to Vienna, they only gave it to the people they could leave. But most of the people in Vienna were Austrian, Romanian, Polish, Hungarian, and their quotas were completely filled. When we came to London in 1938, Rabbi Schoenfeld was our guide, took us to his secondary school, and he made the beds for us and prepared because we came a few days earlier than expected. And I must say, all the cries of the little children, we had to comfort them. They didn't know what happened to them, that their parents were gone. And it took many years for them to adjust to this. And many of them stayed in London and served in the army during the war and made good life for themselves. But I only want to emphasize the parents. I cannot fully understand how parents were able to let their children go. And we all have to appreciate our parents and, and all of you feel good that you have your children with you and you can take care of them. My sister, Erica Jesselson, who was the founder of Yeshiva University Museum, had a luncheon here about 12 or 13 years ago for the kinder transport. And it was well attended, but not like today. I think this is just wonderful. I want to thank you all for coming and keep working for YU Museum, Leo Beck Institute, the Center for Jewish History is really the most wonderful thing for Jews in America. Thank you, good night. I'm delighted to um, invite Yosef Eisinger, former professor of medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, um, to say a few words. Incidentally, I'm not a professor of medicine. I'm a physicist. <laughs> but I thank Dr. Wisser and Dr. Weitzer for inviting me to speak on this, speak, I suppose, as a superannuated poster child to represent the kinder transport children. The kinder transport uh, did indeed provide a ray of sunlight in the dark days the German and Austrian Jews lived through following the Anschluss, but particularly following Kristallnacht in November 38. That event mobilized a remarkable Dutch feminist, Gertrude Weissmuller, Weim, along with a partner of hers, another feminist, 
from Holland, to form a committee that eventually succeeded in saving about 10,000 children, Jewish children, in Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Stansk. She personally persuaded Adolf Eichmann, who was then in charge of Viennese uh, Jews, to permit train loads of Jewish children to go to any country willing to accept them. As it turned out, though, it was only the United Kingdom, England, that was willing to accept any of the Jewish children. Tuus, that was her nickname, personally also saved hundreds of other children all over Europe. And after Holland was occupied by the Nazis, she chose to remain there, even though she could have left. She was in Paris at the time. And she continued her rescue work and her resistance work throughout the war. Her heroic efforts were recognized after the war, included by Yad Vashem. And I congratulate the Leo Beck Institute and Yeshiva University Museum for doing a wonderful exhibit at this time. But as a beneficiary of Jewish Wishmuller's efforts, I want to add my own celebration of that plucky lady. I will do so by sketching my own experiences as a kind, although these are by no means typical. In fact, none of them are typical. <laughs> they are indeed more ben more benign, my own experiences, than most, because my parents survived the Holocaust, unlike the parents of most of the other kinder who were murdered by the Nazis. It is 80 years ago that the Wehrmacht occupied Austria and the kinder transports came into being. While 80 years seem like a, a time span of historical proportions to most people, I recall those dramatic events with remarkable clarity. I was 15, a plebiscite to decide if Austria would remain independent or join Germany had been set uh, for the 13th of March, and the political parties in Vienna covered the city with slogans and leaflets. But with Hitler's invasion on the 12th of March, the plebiscite issue became moot. The Nazis quickly took charge, and by April, just one month later, all Jews were required to list all of their positions to facilitate the confiscation that soon followed. Viennese Jews were soon desperate to find a way out of, the, out of Greater Germany by any means to find a visa and other words for any country at all. My father wrote to an English, bus uh, to an English business associate of his and told him of our family's plight, and he in turn to a certain Mr. de Costa, a Sephardic Jew who was, I suspect, the tipster for horse races of the man that my father had approached. Mr. de Costa's family promptly hired my sister as an au pair, and she became the first member of our family to escape. Sometime later, Mr. de Costa undertook to sponsor me, at least he registered me as, a, uh, as being the object of his sponsorship, and to have my name placed on the kinder transport in 1939, April or May, I forget. However, when I actually arrived in London with the transport, Mr. de Costa had a change of heart and refused to sign any papers in spite of being told that I would be shipped back to Germany. Instead, he, along with his son, contrived to kidnap me from a waiting room in Victoria Station and took me to their home. Incidentally, his son later joined the RAF and became one of the few 
Mr. De Costa thereupon said to me, Joey, that's all I'm going to do for you. You're on your own. Thanks to uh, uh, one of the committees, the refugee committees, uh, I, I thanked him warmly, of course, for what he had done, and I didn't mind that he shook his hands, uh, shook him any responsibility for taking care of me. And eventually, some refugee committee found a job for me as a farm lad on a village in Yorkshire. I worked as a farm lad for about a year, and then my sister told me of an opening as a trainee in, a royal, in the Park Royal Hotel in Brighton. I gave notice to the farmer and began my job, which turned out to be principally that of uh, the hotel's dishwasher. I washed dishes uh, from about eight in the morning until nine at night. After the fall of France in 1940, uh, when an invasion of England was thought to be imminent, I was interned along with all other enemy aliens who lived within 50 miles of the coast. After several weeks of very, in various internment camps, I was shipped to a prison camp in Canada and then several others in that country. And I worked as a lumberjack and a carpenter, very useful trades and attended an informal camp school run by internees. I'd been out of school for several years by then, you realize. I was eventually released as a student, which is a story of its own. I won't have time to tell you about. I eventually joined the Canadian Army and graduated from the University of Toronto after the war. By then, my life had become somewhat calmer and I entered the more predictable career of a research scientist and after I retired of a historian of science. A couple of years ago, I wrote an account of my reminiscences of those turbulent immigration and war years and called it Flight and Refuge. Last year, I learned that the Day ÖV, which is the Archive of Austrian Resistance, wished to publish a German translation of my book. And last month, I met with the editor of the German edition in Vienna. I will bring my story full circle by telling you of that occasion and telling you of a visit I paid to my former high school the Akademische Gymnasium in Vienna. That school, incidentally, sends to this day, every year, two classes to Auschwitz. And when they come back, they tell the whole assembly of the school about what they had learned there. After chatting with a couple of teachers, I was invited to address students of the school and tell them more about the experiences I had 80 years earlier. After my talk, these students asked me many questions which showed such compassion and empathy of what had, for what had happened that when I finally left the school building, it was with a, re with a renewed sense of hope. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Lucy Lang and Josef Eisinger for sharing their memories of kinder transport. My name is Billy Weitzer, Executive Director of the Leo Beck Institute. And I am very happy to be here and want to extend my thanks to my colleague, Jacob Wise, who already extended his this way, and to all the staff at the Yeshiva University Museum and the Leo Beck Institute. I also want to thank members of my uh, board of uh, trustees who are here tonight. I hope I don't miss anyone, but Marianne Sofair was already mentioned, Dennis Baum, and LBI President Ronald Solbo, and I thank them for coming. 
<clears throat> this has been especially rewarding work for me and listening to the stories from Lucy Lang and Josef Isinger and the stories told in the exhibit um, make it obvious why. But there's another reason, because LBI has been working on the entire year 1938. Every day in 2018, we've posted an entry from that day in 1938. We've told personal stories about the Anschluss, which was the German invasion of Austria, as families tried to leave Germany and Austria, as hopes rose and fell during the Avion Conference, and as the noose tightened leading to Kristallnacht on November 9th. Tonight, we recognize kinder transport, which came only a few weeks after Kristallnacht. Part of the message of our 1938 project is that families did not know what was coming. In early 1938, I don't think they could have imagined placing their children on trains without knowing if they would ever see them again, which was the point that Lucy made. Yet, by late 1938, the parents of 10,000 children did exactly that. In addition to our Kinder, uh, Kinder Transport website, I hope that um, you'll look at the website as well as go to the Clifford and Catherine Goldsmith Gallery on the mezzanine level where there is a full explanation of the project. At this point, I want to turn to David Brown from the Leo Beck Institute and Alona Maradoff from the Yeshiva University Museum who are going to read a few letters from the exhibition. Bear with us for just a minute. We have uh, slides of the letters that we're going to read. Um, and uh, they come from collections at the Leo Beck Institute that have actually all been digitized. So they're things that you can also see online. Um, they're, they're, of course, also in the exhibition. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're, we're going to read three letters. This, this first letter is from Leopoldina Katcher of Vienna to her son, Heinz Ludwig. Um, and she wrote it 10 days after he departed on a kinder transport. Um, uh, Heinz Ludwig was the daughter of uh, Alfred and Leopoldina. Alfred um, represented a firm that sold razors and shaving supplies in Vienna. And uh, Heinz Ludwig and his sister, Liana, both went to England. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wednesday, December 28th, 1938. My very beloved Bubli, my dearest child, now you are already 10 days away, an eternity to us. Everything in the house reminds us of you, my Burli. We only rarely enter your room and we do not listen to music. Nothing gives us any pleasure. The only thing which makes us more content is that you are doing well and that you can finally be a jovial human being again, a child to whom the world is open. May luck be on your side as you deserve, my fine, good Burli. You have experienced enough of our struggle. Life has become very difficult for us, but you should finally breathe freely and help us begin a new life in a new country. Heaven cannot and may not tear us apart. This much love may not be kept apart. I am so happy that you have such a good place to live. One must not totally despair as long as there are good people where you are who give pleasure to you, poor little children. Just be grateful that all is good. People envy us. It was so hard for me to let you go, Borli, and so many mothers envy me. But I thought about it very thoroughly and put aside all my motherly feelings. I saw that you must breathe another, better air. There were plenty of concerns. But be happy and content. We must all come together again happily. Hopefully, heaven will make this possible. I hold you tight and kiss you countless times. So um, that's a letter from 1938. Leo Beck Institute has um, 331 letters in this collection that uh, span until 1942. Um, they mostly document um, Alfred and uh, Leopoldina's attempts to emigrate uh, to uh, a number of different countries. They tried the United States. They were considering Shanghai. Um, ulti ultimately, they were unsuccessful, and the letters end shortly before their deportation in 1942. This letter is from Eva Kolisch, also of Vienna. Um, and she's writing to her father, an architect named Otto Kolisch. Um, at, at the time that she wrote this letter, 
uh, in September <clears throat> 1939. Uh, she and her two brothers were in England uh, already, and the father um, had uh, plans to emigrate via England to the United States and uh, was probably underway. So she's writing with the expectation of hopefully seeing her father in the UK um, before he heads on. And um, it's also uh, notable that this is one day after the German invasion of Poland. Um, and her main concern in this letter is the, the uncertain emigration plans for her mother, who was still in Vienna at the time. Southampton, September 2nd, 1939. Dear Papa, I am writing a letter and don't really know why, but I am surely not the only person to do something on this 2nd of September without really knowing why, just to calm one's nerves. Say, Papa, are there no possibilities to get Muti out? Really none? Can she not get out via Italy? There must be trains running there. Papshi, I have to ask you for one thing. As terrible as it is for you and for us all, you cannot be too upset because we need a healthy father who is younger than his years. Muti needs a healthy man. Please, if possible, do not stay in London. Do you have a gas mask? You can get it for free at the ARP. How about money? Do you have any? Maybe I can borrow a few pounds for you. Also, Papschi, Kopf hoch, ein Billion Kussel, Eva. And um, that's uh, one, one billion kisses, or actually one trillion kisses. She wrote 12 zeros. Um, uh, OK, so Elena, Alona's going to read one more letter. Um, I will read excerpts from a letter uh, from Gisela Reich in Vienna to her son, Alfred Bader. And you see that he was in Canada at this point. Uh, he was one of many, many um, older teenage boys uh, who were originally from Austria or Germany who were interned, um, some of them on the Isle of Man, others in Canada or other places. Um, Gisela Reich was Alfred Bader's um, aunt and adopted mother. The letter is from June 11, 1942. My beloved, dear, only child, day and night, my thoughts and worries are with you, my everything. I beg you, be careful with your health and life. Do not do anything dangerous. Don't be sad if, God forbid, your exams turn out to be more difficult. And thank God, my beloved child, that you passed the matriculation so young and so brilliantly. That means a great deal. My beloved child, follow only the advice of your benefactors. We are all in best of health. I beg you, my all, always be careful when swimming. Do not swim underwater. Do not stay in the water too long. Take care not to get your sunburned or a sunstroke. My beloved Bobby Lee, my good Alfred child, there are so many, many worries about a beloved child so far away. I repeat my worries so often because I'm not certain which letter reaches your beloved hands. My beloved child, may God guard you and protect you in all your ways and give you Eliyahu Hanavi as a guardian. May you find the grace in the eyes of God and of humans. My everything, I bless you. And a mother's blessing builds homes for her children. Thousands and thousands of kisses to you, my golden, your ever and always loving mother. This was the last letter from Gisela Reich to her son, Alfred Bader. Shortly after writing this letter, she was deported to the Theresienstadt concentration camp, and she died there on November 23rd, 1942. And you will find this, as well as the other two and many other letters in the exhibit. Thank you. Thank you, David and Alona. Now that we are 80 years away from these events, 
it is critical that we think about how to keep the memories of 1938 alive and relevant. I want to leave you with three thoughts on that. First, to reach younger generations, I believe that we need to teach the big picture, but a very successful starting point is the story of an 11-year-old child, a 28-year-old mother, or a 50-year-old grandfather. This point was illustrated by the stories of Lucy Lang, Joseph Eisinger, and the letters that were just read. Secondly, to keep this alive with younger generations, we have to teach them where they are, and that means using the latest technology, the World Wide Web, mobile phones, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Last but not least, we need to keep the past present. History can be a good teacher, but we are often not the best students. 1938 and kinder transport can teach stories about migration, assimilation, prejudice, and resilience. And we can learn from both the similarities and the differences between then and now. Joseph Eisinger was nice enough to be a part of a video project that we did this year. And I want to quote him to illustrate. He said, under the right circumstances, you can make people believe in anything and to be suspicious of people who are different. And it can be, and it can be exploited by political parties. The only protection is to have a very strong democratic tradition. And he was talking about 1938. This is one of the many lessons to be learned from the history that YUM and LBI preserve through our work. And we thank you for being here and hope that you'll go up. If you haven't seen the exhibit, uh, please check it out now. If it's too crowded or you want more time, uh, the exhibit is up until May 24th. We're going to have curated tours that you can find online. And we'll also have more uh, programming related to the exhibit. So again, I thank you very much for coming. I think, I think that's an excellent point, and in our presentation today, we did not talk about that, but believe me that in our research and in our exhibit, we've thought about all the roles that people played, not just the parents who let their children go, not just the children, but the parents who were their foster, their, their, they also had foster siblings, so you're absolutely right. There are many, many, and there were international organizations that played a role, as well as I was talking with someone today, there were people that adults that came on the trains with the children and had to come back to Germany or else the kinder transport would have been canceled. So there are many, many very important heroes in this and we did not mean to leave anybody out. Thank you.